All right, good morning, everyone. It is Tuesday, February 9th, and uh, this is our Impact Tuesday webinar for February. Um, I am Jennifer Krishka, CEO of the Jewish Women's Foundation of the Greater Palm Beaches. We are a social change organization dedicated to advancing the status of women and girls in the United States and in Florida. So we are joined today uh, by two wonderful people. So Michael and Jackie are joining us from Compass. Uh, and we are going to talk about the Trans Economic Empowerment Program. Um, and so we actually uh, did have Michael on several months ago to talk about the program, but now we have Jackie Brown, who has been hired as the um, program coordinator. So we're going to hear more about the specifics of the program, how it's going, what's happening you know, during COVID. Um, if you have any questions, as always, please submit them through the Q&A feature and not through the chat, and we'll make sure to get to them. So it is 10.01, so we'll go ahead and just get started. Um, so thank you to both of you for being here. I really appreciate you taking time out of your busy workday, I am sure, to uh, speak with us today. Thank you for having us. <laughs> um, yes, we're so happy to see you. Uh, so I guess, Michael, we'll start with you just to give us some background on Compass in general. Um, mm -hmm. You can tell us about what you do there, what Compass is doing, and then Jackie will get more into the specifics of the program. Okay, thank you very much. So good morning, everybody. It's good to be here. I can't really see anybody, but it's good to see you all. <laughs> um, and um, uh, yeah, Compass, um, some of you may remember, Compass is the only LGBTQ community center in Palm Beach County. Um, which also makes us the largest. Um, we used to be the largest in the Southeast United States, um, but some other people have gotten pretty big, which is great for them. We're, we're happy to see it. Um, but as the only community center, LGBTQ community center in Palm Beach County, um, you know, we really do a lot. Um, stuff that you see, stuff that you don't see, um, probably the stuff that you don't see is, is the more important aspect of what we're doing. Um, but, uh, you know, we are responsible for throwing Palm Beach Pride and other major LGBTQ themed events. Um, clearly with COVID, those have been canceled. Um, we're looking to this year to kind of bring some of those back as safely as possible. Um, but we also have a youth program, um, which is crucially important to giving uh, kids a safe space to be themselves. Um, it is an in-person program except for COVID. I mean, everything we're doing, I'm just going to put a disclaimer, everything I'm about to say is virtual right now. Right. Um, so the youth group is still meeting. Um, we do do HIV testing in the center still, but by appointment only. Um, the center is actually under construction right now. Um, oh. Or yeah, we're we're adding a medical clinic inside the oh, actual wow. center. Mm -hmm. That's a big so deal, right? It's a huge deal. It's a giant deal. Um, and uh, the construction hopefully is going to be done in March. And you know, like you look for silver linings, and um, this kind of was a silver lining because we had this construction plan for a while. And with the center kind of being closed, you know, other than appointment, um, it was the perfect time to have the center go under construction. So, wow. you know, what, um, what kind of services will be offered? That is a great question. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> um, Compass is an HIV servicing organization um, first. Um, we work with people who are HIV positive um, and their their families. Um, so we operate under something called the Ryan White Grant, um, and that gives us the ability to help people that are living with HIV and AIDS um, access to doctors and services and health care um, that they might not know that they're eligible for or anything. So we're bringing some of those services in-house. So whereas before we would have to send them out to somebody, mm -hmm. now we can see them here. So if somebody comes in and say they get a test, and they learn that they're HIV positive. Mm -hmm. um, not only does our case management team jump into action right away, but now this clinic will be able to actually get you know them seen by a, a licensed medical professional um, immediately. 
Uh, so, and then there's going to be other testing, you know, STD testing, things like that. Um, so that's, that's the big exciting news right now. Yeah, uh, that's really amazing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so good luck with that. And I hope that you know, everything goes well with construction and it's actually on time. <laughs> so. Yeah, you know, I think I feel like it is. And I, and I know that that's an amazing thing. We've run into some problems, but, um, but it's gone relatively smoothly. It's funny, I go into the center once a week on the staff and duty on Wednesdays. And every time I go in, it's something new. So it's kind of fun. Good. So, and I'm glad to hear that you're still able to offer services uh, even during COVID. Yeah, there's no service that we offer that we aren't offering virtually. Um, and, you know, Jennifer, we were talking a little bit earlier when you asked how it was and stuff, when we talk about mental health, um, our mental health department is exploding. Um, yeah. The number of requests that we have is just gigantic. Um, it's growing. Uh, we're referring out. So that's another big thing. And I think that's a sign of the times. And, and for me, the silver lining is that if, if something comes from all of this again, and it's a, it's a deeper appreciation from everybody of mental health and, sure. and the, you know, that I look to that as well to kind of maybe be a, a good thing that came from all of this. If right. that's possible, and I'm not trying to be right. insensitive. No, um, no, I hear what you're saying, and I, I ask, I also am hoping that this will give an emphasis to the importance of mental health services mm -hmm. and for people to have access to mental health. Um, so that would be a, a great, you know, silver lining outcome, if nothing else, you know, from this experience. So, all right, so Jackie, let's <laughs> go ahead and turn over to you. Um, so, tell us about about yourself. So um, I guess one, tell us your title. Um, and then let's talk a little bit about the program itself. And of course, we'd love to hear about your background um, and kind of, you know, why you wanted to be in this role. Um, so I am the program coordinator for the Transgender Economic Empowerment Program. I um, came to know about the role through Michael. Um, we had had an introductory meeting one day and she had um, explained to me that they had received a grant and that there was this program that they were trying to launch. And somehow, some way, I was like, oh my gosh, this position is for me. Um, I have had a hobby for as long as I could remember of helping my friends and my family and my coworkers with um, setting up their resume and interview skills. So it was like, you know, a godsend to find this position. So with the program, um, there is basically a, um, we're offering linkage to services for transgender people, specifically transgender women of color, mm -hmm. where we are linking them with um, employers that may be hiring. Um, if they need services such as housing or mental health or um, also obtaining interview attire. So we're linking them to those services and in a way helping them to gain stability that they may not have had otherwise. Mm -hmm. And let's talk about this population of people mm -hmm. and why it's so important and that specifically um, you're trying to help uh, trans women. So with this population, um, just LGBTQ people in general face discrimination in the workplace, specifically transgender women will, and um, they are disproportionately um, discriminated against. So sometimes transgender women will result to working um, in different environments that may not be conventional. So this program gives them an opportunity to find their way into the workplace in a comfortable manner in which they can feel like they are actually a value to the workplace that they're in and also strengthen their skills and their personal development. And that's very necessary in our um, community, to be honest with you. Sure, sure. Um, so let's talk about the specifics of the program. So um, what exactly happens? So like someone comes 
to be part of this program? And then like, you know, like what are the steps? <laughs> okay. So um, as of now, we're receiving a lot of referrals from other departments within Compass. Um, someone would basically be referred to me. I reach out to them and basically have a conversation with them, ask them a few questions about where they are, their employment background, and also a big and important thing has been determining if they need any personal needs met. So that could be housing or food, um, access to telephone or internet. And then at that time, while we're communicating, I'm asking them questions about their employment history. If they even have a resume, have they ever had a job? Where could they possibly see themselves working? And from there, we um, put together a plan to assist them with actually getting their resume up to par, interview skills, um, getting attire for the workplace and interviews, and also identifying any additional needs that they need met so that we can link them with agencies that can help them. Okay, so you do a lot of partnering right within yes. the communities in terms of like even from the wardrobe piece to um, with employers is that right yes we're doing a lot of partnering we set up the program to um, include a lot of partnering such as for example um, we compass has a directory of businesses for the pride business alliance um, so if we are First, linking with them to see if they have any open positions, any open roles that our clients can um, actually interview for. If someone needs interview clothing, we would link them with Dress for Success. Mm -hmm. um, if someone needs housing, we would find um, partners in the county that can help them with that. That's amazing. Um, what would you say? is the, I guess the average age maybe of someone who is coming to you for this program. I'm just um, curious to know like, if it's really, really varied or if it tends to be people who are newer to the workforce. As of now, it's varied. I have received um, a few young adults, 18 to 20, mm -hmm. and I had one individual that was 50. So, we it's like it's theory mm -hmm. and uh, can I say something with, about like, that yeah of course of course sorry <laughs> to jump in yeah um you know what makes this program so interesting is that um when trans people when they come out it's like it's a reset almost it's it's kind of like I, I I joke all the time we're going through puberty again and it's not really a joke I mean we are our bodies obviously are changing and things but also we kind of reset to that time where everything is so new um and we don't know what to do and there are a lot of trans people that lose their jobs when they come out they're fired um you know I know it's illegal to just say you're fired but Right. People can get fired for a variety of things. And so you have these people of all ages that are really in a place where they need this program. Um, so when Jackie says, you know, a 50 year old coming to us, um, it's not like they've just been sitting around for 50 years. Right. You know, they might have actually been in really good shape and all of a sudden find themselves in a situation where the career that they've had is gone. Um, what are they going to do? Who are they going to see? Plus, you know, how scary it is. And I know, personally, um, I run a transgender, a, a gender support group Thursday nights. And the people that access that are of all ages. And many of them are later on in life. Um, so yeah, it's a, that's a really good question, you know, about like, who are we seeing? But that's, it's, it's literally every trans person out there um, mm -hmm. could use these services. Sure. I mean, so I guess that's something else that I was curious about is like in terms of their journey, are a lot of these women, have they transitioned and been living as a woman for like five years before they come to you? Or would you say that most of these women have recently transitioned? It varies. Again, I have an individual who identifies as transgender, however, has not medically transitioned. 
I have individuals who have fully transitioned, and I have um, individuals in the program that are just getting, just beginning with the transition. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the reason why I was asking is that I guess I'm wondering if they were let go or uh, because they were transitioning uh, while they were at, you know, their place of employment and the transition was like something that the employer was just not supportive of, or if they felt like um, they couldn't stay in their place of employment, even if they had not been let go. Um, so I'm just sort of curious, I guess, about the background and you know how that affects them, whether they stay, whether they leave, um, you know. Prior to um, beginning the program, I had this idea that we would receive clients that were basically not working because they were relying on sex work mm. or had been pushed out of the workplace, as you mentioned. What I'm finding is that this program is not just helping our clients with obtaining employment, but it's also helping them develop their self-esteem and their self-worth because the individuals that I've worked with, they have work experience. They're currently working, but they've placed themselves in these boxes and they weren't really sure how to get out of them. So it's in a way we're kind of helping them, like giving them that boost that they didn't know that they had or could use to get ahead. Okay. Yeah, it's. I think it's very interesting. Um, you know, so we're obviously very proud to be able to support a program like this. Um, which is one of few, right, Michael, like you said, in the, even within the U.S., there are a lot yeah. of programs like this. Yeah, that was another thing that we were, we were really getting excited about is that this is one of the first, um, and um, there are other, like, if you typed in uh, transgender employment into Google, you're going to get a lot of different things, and there are some groups out there that you'll find um, that that might offer some help or, or something, but nothing like this. Um, out in California, um, there are some programs like this that are more structured. You know, they they're attached to community centers. I mean, the LGBTQ community center in LA has like a budget of like four hundred million dollars a year yeah. or something. Sure, um, like <laughs> that makes you know, sense. We're, yeah, we're in the two million dollar range. And to give you an idea, um, there's a group called Centerlink that that we're all like all community centers, LGBTQ community centers can be a part of. And they run, um, you know, they do statistics and they run analyses and stuff. We're considered a, a moderate to large community center with a budget of two million. So that kind of shows you right. what's available out there in the United States that encompasses a large right. you know, by that <laughs> metric. Um, so we are one of the first in the country to really be pushing for this. And it couldn't have come really at a more um, appropriate time when you consider some of the global things that are happening. COVID has hit. That's obviously made it very hard. Um, it's not just trans people that are struggling for jobs. Sure. It's everybody. Um, you know, people have been impacted. The service industry is just, you know, wasted. Um, and so, you know, that is, it's timely in that regard, but it's also timely because of the Supreme Court's decision last summer um, to bar or to extend, I don't want to say bar, because that's a negative. It's not. It is an extension of the rights that every American citizen has to not be discriminated against in the workplace. Um, so there is this kind of burgeoning awareness of the needs um, for uh, understanding, um, for hiring diverse groups of people. Um, and that's another thing that this program is gonna be doing is working with the businesses themselves to get them to the level where they can confidently employ um, LGBTQ people, but trans people. Um, and if they're looking at that for their employees, that makes the customer experience better. So this is just, you know, it really is blossoming and it's just the right time for it. And, and JWF's, um, I mean, foresight, your vision with this is really impressive. Um, and I think that in the future, you're going to see more programs like this popping up all over the country. But you were one no, of I mean, the I, I certainly hope so. I mean, and maybe this is a, a program that can be a pilot. Um, for mm -hmm. other communities, especially for other communities that don't have like a $400 million budget. 
you know, and, and you're trying to make it work with creativity and, you know, maximizing partnerships and resources, um, you know, in your community, as opposed to having just tons and tons of dollars uh, to, you know, to really help you. Absolutely. And, you know, to, to say something about that, you know, I feel that Compass's reputation in the county is 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 good. It's mm -hmm. in good standing. Um, right. If people know what it is, you know, not everybody does. It doesn't pop up all the time. But JWS standing also is just like so having <laughs> so having an organization like JWF to 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 be backing this and and to put it out there. And you know, obviously, when you get a grant, you want to tip your hat to the people that are that are providing and stuff. But we have the logos on the website and on the in the e blast that we have and stuff. Not just because we're proud to be associated with JWF, but we know that when people see that, it's kind of like, a, okay, these are this is legit. These are. <laughs> These are good people doing good things. Um, so thank you for that. Of course. And thank you for saying that. <laughs> I certainly hope people see JWF that way in the community. Uh, so Jackie, let's turn back to you. So um, I'm interested like in your background, um, is this a full-time role right now? Um, you know, I guess like tell us a little bit more about you and um, if there are other aspects that attracted you to the position besides just being someone who loves to help your friends and family with their, uh, with their resume building. Yeah. Like, were you involved so, with Compass at all before, um, uh, before you met with Michael and, and moved into the role? Um, no, I was not involved with Compass before, um, applying for the role. I have been working in healthcare. Um, as long as I've been an adult. So about 14 years now. And I have um, been in different roles in healthcare from office management to recruiting, um, to preceptorship and training of employees. So it seems like a perfect fit again because of those experiences that I've had. And being able to have a view, not only from healthcare, but also from my experience working in retail and working in sales and also working in the restaurant business. So I, you know, kind of- Lots of myself. customer service. <laughs> yes, yes, lots of service oriented industry. So I've kind of spread myself in a way that I felt made me more well-rounded as an employee. Mm -hmm. um, so again, that was just something else that I was, felt that I could bring to the position itself. Can I jump in real quick? Yeah, of course. <laughs> and I'm going to say something about Jackie. You know, you um, you're ask, you're asking Jackie about her background, and um, she is uh, very modest. Um, it was an unbelievable, just again, like almost like this kind of uh, karmic, kismetic kind of meeting, um, where we were looking for somebody to fill this position. Um, and you know, it is a part-time thing. And so okay. it's a brand new thing too. Like it has to be built from the ground up. Right. So finding somebody that has the skill set to do that. I mean, I'm not going to lie. There were times where we were like, <laughs> we, this isn't going to happen. Like, we're not going to be able to find this person. And then literally she just kind of dropped into her lap. <laughs> and when I was talking to her and it wasn't about the position, it was just a, Hey, you need to meet this person. And we were talking. And as we we're talking, I just kind of was like, wait a second. And I, I brought up the, the fact that we were doing this and it brought, and she starts talking about her hobby of getting people jobs. <laughs> <laughs> get Quite a hobby. <laughs> I was like, wait a second, like, is, am I on candid camera? Like, that shows my age, um, you know, I guess. But, um, but I was like, I can't believe that this person exists and she does and and the things that she has created for this program and the, the, the you know, just from sitting um, and, and in front of a computer and putting things in place to get this so that when people are in the program, and they are, when people access the program, it's just doing what it's supposed to be doing is quite phenomenal. Truly, so, we were very lucky. So let's go back to something that you had said before, Jackie, which I think maybe Michael, we had also talked about the last time we had you on, but I wanna talk about the sex work piece um, and how 
you know, trans women in general are also at a higher risk for, um, for violence. Um, and so this program is not only helping them, let's say to move like into a better employment position, but for, for a lot of these women, right, this is like, I don't want to say maybe life, life or death, but um, it's really getting them in a position where they no longer have to be um, doing really unsafe, you know, unregulated types of work. So, I mean, like what, you know, what are your feelings about that? What can you say about that? This is for both yeah, of you. From, yes, from what we know, trans women are kind of in a way forced into sex work um, because we live in a country where money is what you need to survive and it's a means of survival for them. Um, some people don't have any perception or any view on what else to do. So they resort to sex work, they resort to different um, ways of making money that aren't you know, normal to us or conventional. Um, so it does place them in a position where they are exposed to violence and concerns about their health and well-being. So in a way, this program also helps, not only helps them change their perception about the world in which they live in, by changing their work environment, but it also um, helps them to build their self-esteem, like I mentioned before, and um, see the, a bigger picture and a light at the end of the tunnel. Because sometimes um, what I found as well is that some of these trans women, um, they think this is all they'll ever do they'll only ever be in this position. So it, it, it's like almost a beacon of hope for them. Yeah, one of the things that, that we found incredibly interesting during um, her interview is that when, when Jackie had an opportunity to ask us questions, that was, the, that was the subject of her first question. She said, if somebody comes to us who is currently in, the, you know, in sex work, um, what is our response going to be? Are we going to work with that person? And, and our response was Compass is a sex positive organization. I think, Jennifer, you hit it really just perfectly unregulated and unsafe um, thing. You know, there's no, uh, we don't have a moral judgment on that. We know right. what can lead to that. Um, unfortunately, believe it or not, and, and like you said, as a safety thing, um, trans women, they're, we are fetishized. There are a large number of people out there that look for trans women, but there's a lot of shame associated with that. And it's usually a very private thing. Um, so if they're with a person and, and, and it's discovered, that can be very dangerous to the, to the trans person. Um, if they're with somebody that isn't looking for that and it's discovered, that's another place where you get so when Jackie asked us like how are we going to be dealing with this again it's not a moral judgment it's a we need to get these people into a position where they're more safe where because as Jackie said I mean if 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 it's between that and starving to death you're going to do that you know you're you're not going to just sit there and wither away and if that's your only option you know you don't know where these people are coming from you don't know what led to it um in the trans community it is something that happens a lot and you do see it because people like i said you know those 15 year olds that have career-long jobs and all of a sudden find themselves what are they going to do where are they going to go so that that question from jackie was very prescient and i think it shows you know, one, a major, uh, I don't want to say demographic, but it is a lot of people that are coming from this program are going to have a history with that in some way. And we sure. can't be judgmental about it. And it really is something that is important for them to know and understand that there is no judgment here about that. Um, so it's, it's right. an important question. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's also one of the aspects of us supporting this program that I think is so important to me is that I do know that that is a unfortunately um, something that trans women end up having to do. Um, and I know that it's so, so, so dangerous to be in that position. And so, you know, the social change piece of this program, I think is not only, um, you know, I guess removing the stigma 
of trans people um, and just normalizing them in the workplace with everybody else. Um, but it's also the reduction in violence um, against you know, trans people and trans women specifically um, that I think you know, can have a huge impact on the community. There was an amazing interview on NPR not too long ago. I'll find it and I'll send it to you, Jennifer, sure. if you want to do anything with it. Sure. Where they talk about the normalization of trans people and how important it is. Um, you know, that, that, that we're not this group of people that are just like these weird, fad like things. You know, I've talked a lot about how I think that the medical science, the, the cultural awareness of, of us is making it easier for people to live their authentic lives. But that doesn't mean that there are all of these barriers. And what you just said, normalizing, just, you know, having us on and just talking to us and seeing, oh, my gosh, there are people you know, I mean, that sounds so corny, but it's so true. Um, and so a program like this and what you're doing at JWF, you know, it, it every step forward is a step in the right direction. Yeah, I agree. I mean, we care about all women and girls. <laughs> so whether that means you're cis or that means you're trans, you know, we want all women and girls to thrive. Drop in the head of vocabulary, nice. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I have had a lot of uh, experience with the trans community actually for a very long time. So having friends, you know, who have gone through that um, transition and all of that. So um, yeah, I think it is really important. And I, I do think that um, for people who may not see the automatic connection, even if what you care about is women and girls and you hadn't considered the trans population, I think violence against trans women it's not only like homophobia and an array of other things, but I also think it's a form of misogyny. And so I think if nothing Thanks else- for saying that. You're absolutely right. It's, um, that's, it, it's rooted in that power dynamic. And, you know, and I think, and we, I've talked about this with other trans women in particular, you know, there's kind of, I think, part of it, and it's almost like a subconscious thing. I think if you ask somebody, they would never admit this out loud, but you're leaving the club, you know, you're leaving the, you're, you're leaving the male existence and who's crazy enough to do that? Who would do that? You know, why would you give up all the privilege that comes in our society with being male? Um, and, and it really is just, um, you know, it's just this, unbelievable thing to see and the reasons why it exists the way that it does. And that's a big piece of it. That's very, very interesting that you said that, very astute. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really interesting component um, for people who are trans. So I have a good friend uh, who was a trans man um, who I've known since I was in college. And so I knew them before they transitioned, um, but also, you know, during the transition. Um, and he's also black. So, you know, there are of course like racial dynamics involved with that too, but I, I thought it was really interesting. We were having a conversation once and he was saying that the things that he experienced as a trans man were so interesting because other men just, you know, would treat him like a man. And so the, like the sexism and the misogyny that he would be exposed to, you know, just like other men saying things to him about women um, was something that he never really anticipated and uh, was just like an interesting, I guess, experience to have that kind of in, you know, like insider um, perspective on what, you know, some men um, can say and how some men view women um, and just how that was, you know, just such a jarring experience. That's really fascinating. And I, and I can understand it and I can anticipate that because a lot of trans men um, are, you know, the term is passable. I hate, I hate right. the, using the word, but that's what it is. You know, right. they can pass as cisgender men. Right. Um, and, and so in that environment where they are men, but they have a history that is from a different perspective and a different right. side. To all of a sudden be in a situation where you're around men being men, I can see where that would be shocking. You know, right. I really sure. can. Sure, and I suppose on the other side, um, for trans women who are, I guess, passing, right, who are now subjected to um, harassment, 
and objectification and all kinds of other things that, you know, perhaps before that they had not experienced, I imagine is also um, probably a, a jarring experience too. Well, that's another piece, and Jackie, you can pipe in anytime. I'm, I'm talking a lot, um, but that's another piece where we talk about, you know, when you transition, everybody pays attention to the medical, you know, the physical changes that somebody goes through, but there are so many more layers to it. And one is in the big one, you know, probably after medical is, is that social transition, you know, men and women are treat, uh, treated differently in our society. There are different roles that are expected from men and women. Um, and so when you cross into that place, even for somebody that doesn't, pass, I don't pass, you know, I am not a passable trans person. I am an open, I live openly um, because I really don't, you know, my voice, all of it. I've talked to you all about this before. Yeah. I think. Um, but even for me, it's different. You know, like if I go somewhere and I don't say anything for a while, you know, I'm, I'm getting that kind of attention from men and stuff. And I'll be honest with you, it's unwelcome. I'm like, oh, what is going on here? But there <laughs> is, it's just like this, you know, thing. And then for me, it gets really scary if they find out you know, like if, if they get me to a point where they need me to respond and I right. say, yeah, back off, you know, like that <laughs> problematic for me. Um, but it is this thing that, that exists. And, and, and I think right now it's kind of, it's still new to people, trans people. And so getting back to the conversation about normalization, you know, like I look forward to, I wonder what it's going to be like in 10, 20, 30 years for trans people. Um, you know, to just kind of go through life without people being like, that's a trans person, you know, right. like if you see a lot of trans people and you know trans people, it becomes less uh, fascinating. Right. Um, but I think it's less exotic. Th that's a good word for it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess the downside, though, speaking of the misogyny piece, it's like, I know that I'm going to encounter harassment mm -hmm. um, and I'm aware that I'm female all the time, right? Like there's no space where I can't not think of myself as female because unfortunately, I think the way that our culture is, you're sort of forced into being aware of that all the time, right? Because of the gender role piece and because of the harassment piece. So, um, you know, for trans women who are passing, that's sort of a, like a not great, you know, downside, I guess, is that now you're gonna have to be subjected to that as well. I think there's always that worry, you know. Um, Jackie, is there anything you want to say about this aspect? Yeah. Just to piggyback off of what you were saying, there's always that worry. Um, and however, even if the person is not passable, as Michael was saying, they could still be subjected to those experiences. Sure. And sure. Um, one thing that I try to also work with my clients on is getting them to a place where they're understanding that they're a person first you know they are an individual human first right. i think we always um sometimes we try to get into the labels of people and how they present um sure. but if we just simplize and um everything and minimalize every everything and just got to back down to the basics they're an individual person. So everyone deserves compassion. Everyone deserves understanding and respect. And that's one thing that, like I said, that I try to you know, speak with my clients about. Mm -hmm. So I wanna talk about, um, I guess, cultural competency. Mm -hmm. uh, and if that's a, a component of what this program does, because I know you're of course trying to work with employers and you mentioned trying to get them to a place where, um, you know, that place in employment is going to be comfortable and welcoming for trans folks. So what is there any kind of training that the employer goes through to get them, you know, to that place? Yes. So Michael has a lovely program that she utilizes to um, address different organizations with competency about LGBTQ people. So anyone that we are working directly with, we would expect and ask of them that they go through that training that Michael mm -hmm. offers um, so that they get a better understanding of people outside of what they may know. And also it would help them with working with our clients. 
Right. I imagine it's things like what is appropriate and inappropriate right. um, to that, say to a trans person or to ask them. Yes, and that training, Michael goes over that, you know, the use of pronouns, what's um, correct to ask of someone or how to respond to someone if they tell you that they are trans. So it's important that they go through that training. Sure, sure. And if that's something that, let's say there's um, just a company or an employer in the community mm -hmm. that wants to go through that cultural competency training that you're not already partnering with, is that something that they can do that they can sign up for? Yes, it is. Um, we're actually in the process because of this program. We're also in the process of kind of um, modernizing our training. Um, we're adding some things to it that are important. Um, we're putting things in for businesses specifically that we can take out for social organizations that don't have to worry about like their intake forms, you know. Right. So it's a, it's, a, it's a training that has many facets. Um, but that absolutely anybody that wants that, our initial plans were to offer it at the center in the center space on a quarterly basis, at least like if we if you're not big enough or you don't want us to come to you and to do it, um, you can come to us. That's been shelved because of COVID, sure. but we are giving an incredible amount of we call them cultural competency trainings. Um, we're giving an incredible amount of those trainings right now. Um, I was joking around in a meeting yesterday that last Thursday when I woke up, I had one scheduled. And by the time the workday was over, I had five scheduled for this month. Um, and so really for us, it's uh, anybody that's open to getting this information, we're going to be there to give it to you. Um, right. I feel it's much better that you get it from us than don't get it or right. from somebody else. Um, so yeah, anybody out there who's interested in that kind of training, um, you know, I don't know if I can put my email, Jennifer, yeah, of has course, of course. I'm going to put it in the chat. No, um, of course. And so, also, yeah. you know, Michael, if you want to send me a description or something of um, yeah. the training, I can send it, I can at least send it to, um, our grantees. So, I mean, so I assume you're doing it now virtually. We are, we're doing it virtually. Um, and that's, you know, we prefer that right now. It sure. is different to do it virtually. You know, I mean, everything is different when you're on. Right. Um, it really, the impact of it comes when we're in the same room with each other. Sure. Um, but the information is important. So we're not just sitting on our hands. We will give it virtually in a Zoom setting, um, you know, and uh, so yes, that's okay. it's open and available. So, I mean, so the, the upside to things being virtual is that you can reach people outside of the immediate community. Um, and so, you know, we have a lot of grantees. And so if you send me a description, I can send it out at least to our grantees and let them know this is something that they can do. I'm going to um, email you our marketing materials for it right now. Yeah, that would be great. Um, how do people learn about uh, the cultural competency and then also actually the trans economic employment program? Like I know that you said there were referrals for the program, but um, are there other ways, I guess, to find out about, you know, what Compass is offering? If you're just like a random person in the community and you're like, oh, like maybe this is something I want to do or for people yeah. who don't even know like what, let's say cultural competency is, and it's not like a term that they're familiar with, like how would they, you know, like even think like, oh, maybe my company needs some kind of training on how better, you know, to, uh, to um, welcome or embrace our LGBTQ employees. <laughs> Yeah, that's a that's a good question. I mean, obviously, we have a website, um, and the the training doesn't take a huge um, piece of the website at the moment because we were kind of giving it as people would ask and it would come up. But now with the Trans Economic Empowerment Program, um, we do plan on having it be a bigger piece, a bigger visual piece of what we offer at Compass. Um, so look to that change in the coming months. Um, mm -hmm. But to answer your question. Most often, it's from people that were in it for um, or experienced it for something they're associated with. Like, let's say that we gave it to the JWF, and you know, the people yeah. that are there go back to their organizations, and so it's a word of mouth thing, and it really is exploding right now. Um, but it's also 
The other time that we really see it is, is when there's an organization out there that has gotten themselves into some kind of situation. <laughs> right. start looking so it's more like, reactive how? than proactive, I guess. Yeah, so a little bit, but you know, it's good. I mean, it, if we see information is going to get out there, if it's a, if, if it's a cover your situation, you know, we'll go and we'll do it. And, and, you know, we know that it's not just, uh, oh, okay, we check this off. Um, we get to tell the lawyers that we did a training at our organization. It really is an impactful training. Um, right. You know, I never have somebody that's just like, Ugh. Um, and so it's whatever the reason that they're coming to us, we'll do it. You know, for profit businesses, there's a small charge. Nonprofits, it's for free. Right. Um, you know, and if there are circumstances, we will we will listen because again, it's it's more important to us that that information gets out there than anything else. Sure. Um, and is this a training that you can do? I guess with a like a non-employer, I guess specific mm -hmm. lens. So, like, let's say we did want JWF wanted to do just some kind of cultural competency um, program for our trustees or for anyone from the community who just wants to learn more um, about all of the letters and what everything means. And yeah. um, if you have someone in your life that is transitioning, let's say, because mm. certainly we all will probably encounter that at some point or another, um, like how can you be like an ally for that person? So um, is that something that would be possible? Without question. Absolutely. It's that's why I was saying like, you know, there are going to be pieces that we might not bring. Like if it's a, if it's a, a social awareness kind of thing where the people are there to do exactly what you just said, they maybe know a trans person now, or they're, they're just interested. They want to know how to respect people in general. We'll come in and we'll leave the, Hey, this is how you change your intake forms or deal with bathrooms at your place of work. Right. Leave that stuff out and focus on the things that we know are going to be important to the audience. So we'll work with the people that are, and we'll ask, you know, what are you looking for from this? What is it that you want to walk away from with this? Um, and we can add and take pieces out accordingly. But the base and the core message is there. You're right. going to learn about LGBTQ people. You're going to learn the big thing. And this is the dork. This is the trainer in me coming out. But the biggest thing is, is that there, there are these three terms, gender expression, gender identity, and sexual orientation. And they're all different, but people really think that they're right. the same or right. super tied together. And it's right. not the case. So that is a majority of that training is to talk about what those are and why they're different. Sure. I have definitely experienced that firsthand. Um, so yes. Okay. And then Jackie, in terms of the, you know, the, the trans economic employment program or empowerment program, um, outside of referrals, like how else, um, can somebody learn about this program and can individuals just like refer someone to you? If they're like, Hey, maybe this is a program that you might want to, you know, get into, like, is that something that people can do? And, how, and I guess okay. what would be the best way for them to do that? Well, they can just contact me via email or by phone. Um, of course, we have the website. Um, in the future, I'll be going to different businesses and different organizations and telling them about the program and um, hoping that they'll have um, a way for us to get the information out through them. Um, right now, we're also putting together different press releases. So we recently have a um, press release in South Florida Gay News about mm -hmm. the program itself and how to get in contact with me. I um, mean, I've received um, some contacts from that. We also um, will be blasting on our Instagram and Facebook pretty soon about it. So, and we'll continue to do that. That way we're getting the word out. And if someone may not benefit or may need to may not need to be in the program they could at least let someone know that they sure. know of that may benefit from it yeah i mean make sure to tag jwf in any social posts about the program because then we can go ahead and we'll share it um, with all of our social followers so thank you yeah that's yeah it's amazing i mean and we're you know excited about this program so we want it to be successful um so whatever we can do to be supportive you know 
we're, we're happy to do that. So certainly think about us. If there are things that you come up with um, that we can help you with, let us know. Thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> so, um, so we have about 10 minutes left. Um, so I want to go back to our like practice session, actually. <laughs> so we were talking about JWS Spaces of Resilience event, um, of course, on March 10th. And we have Sandra Bernhardt, who is going to be our featured speaker. And so we were talking a little bit about Pose, um, which I was saying, I think is probably how a lot of people know who she is. Um, but I also think that, at least from my perspective, um, it's a really interesting history as it relates to trans people. Uh, and of course, a lot of the things that you see on the show um, are still issues that we see trans people facing right now. So I'm just curious, I guess, to get your opinion about that, <laughs> about the show from both of you, like if you think that it is um, sort of an educational, I mean, it's certainly entertaining um, for sure, but from a different perspective, you think that it's, it's at all educational for people who don't know anything about the trans community or the history of that. Assuming that you've seen it. <laughs> Go ahead, I haven't seen it. Um, <laughs> but from what I hear, it. it is about, <laughs> um, you know, LGBT culture and ballroom culture. And I think that's, that's vital and important for others to see because it in a way shows how LGBTQ people have come together to create their own community and their own family um, when at times they're not able to have that at home. Um, but like I said, I've never seen it. So mm -hmm. Michael, I maybe recommend a better it. person. <laughs> <laughs> you have so, some time. I am like the worst trans person out there, I guess, because, you know, some of these things, honestly, I, 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 I don't want to say avoid, but I'm like, okay, um, you know, it takes something sometimes, you know, when you're in it and you're living certain aspects, sometimes you don't want it. You want to escape when you're watching right. television. You don't want to, but I have watched episodes of Pose um, and I, I, I'm going to say this about it. I love it for several reasons. And the first reason is, is because this is for anybody that hasn't seen it, Jackie's absolutely right. This is talking about ballroom culture, um, in New York, uh, back in the, you know, eighties era, mm -hmm. um, which comes from the seventies, you know, the ballroom scene was really the only place that LGBTQ people could get together and be safe at the time and it shows that trans people have been there the whole time right. um you know and that's something like i get this all the time it's like why are all these trans people out now like what is it and, and you know you get that <laughs> right. label right. it's a fad you know it's a fad which is just another way of saying it's a phase right and it just drives me nuts because it isn't a fad and you've seen throughout history um trans people exist in all kinds of forms Right now, our medical understanding and our medical sciences has made it easier to do a medical transition than it has been in the past. But we have been there the, the whole time. And um, Pose is a, is a look at that. Um, and the other thing that I want to say about Pose is that it is a television program that is produced by a trans uh, person and trans people. It is written by trans people and it is performed by trans people, mm -hmm. which is an incredibly unique situation. Um, and so, yes, I'm going to tell you the things that you see in there, it's a television show. Right. There's drama. These right. are fictional characters. But the fiction that they're portraying is a realistic look back at what it was like mm -hmm. at the time and how uh, what people needed to do to thrive. And it brings up some of the issues that we're talking about the very first episode one of the main characters is involved in sex work and you right. see that um, yes. and she's involved with that sex work with a, a person that seeks people trans people out you know right um, so just these interesting dynamics but yeah it's a it's it's one of the good ones if you're looking to binge something yeah. i would suggest <laughs> checking out pose um it's a great show drama wise but you're also yeah. going to learn some things without even knowing it <laughs> you're just going to yeah. know stuff yeah. all of a sudden yes but, i will say that i binge watched it in I think like in a weekend or something um because i'm a very committed binge watcher and there are many seasons and i they're currently working actually on the 
on the current season on the next season mm -hmm. um so i will say that i mean i really enjoyed it for so many reasons but i also did learn some things so i recommend it you know i mean to anyone for a variety of reasons but i think that especially if you're less familiar with the trans community um or for people who have a hard time understanding like what it means to be trans and to mm. feel like you're living in the wrong body. Um, I think that it's a really excellent um, way to maybe gain some insight because you see what these women are willing to go through, you mm -hmm. know, to, to be like what it means to be like their authentic self, um, even at their own, like risking their health, right? Like, so like irrespective of the sex work piece, you see like, the injections or mm -hmm. like trying to have bodies that look like a more you know traditional female body um mm -hmm. and just how like desperate they are for that right i mean so i think there's so many interesting components about the show um that can be <clears throat> just very like educational and insightful for someone who just maybe doesn't know that much about the trans experience so there's um uh I, I respect and appreciate everything you just said, and I agree with it. Um, there's another thing on Netflix that doesn't take the commitment of a show like Pose, um, but it really gives an insight. Um, oh my gosh, I'm going to completely blank on the name. <laughs> it's Laverne Cox. It's a documentary. Um, what is it? it? Do you remember? It's like dis Exposure or something like that. But it's, it's a look Disclosure, thank you. I got the er sound right, but it's it's a it's a look at trans people and their portrayal in media and movies and television in particular. And it is absolutely fascinating. And it goes all the way back. One of the first things ever filmed was a gender bending thing, you know, like where there was, I don't I don't know, trans person, but there was this element where the people in it weren't conforming to the gender roles. I mean, this is like turn of the 19th century kind of stuff, you know, when you look back and you see that we really have, this has been something in our society for such a long time and it has been underground. It has been just the subject of movies and these fascinating yes. you know, portrayals of, of things. Um, but it's real people and we've been there, you know, through for forever we have been apart and what you're seeing about pose and showing the struggles that they go through that's not something you're going to get from the cct like that you know we can right. tell you about it we can share some personal stories and we do to help you understand but seeing them struggle and seeing right. what they go through and like you said the injections i mean it was a time when there was just no medical backing right. for trans people at all so they kind of had to do it themselves and they were, and there are horror stories, absolute right. horror stories about the women back then who who had to do things and, and the effects that it's had now. Um, but it is, it's a fascinating, mm -hmm. you know, I of all the things I thought we'd talk about today. Poses, <laughs> we like to keep it interesting on our webinar. Yeah, I know, I mean, I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, like I just feel like we just got transported to like one of those MTV shows where there are <laughs> people about something. It really is good. And, and I agree, if, if, if somebody wants some, you know, check out the first couple episodes. If you don't cry at the first episode. Oh, oh my God. I think I cried like an almost Yeah, episode. no, it got me. Oh. <laughs> I yeah, like, I mean, oh. I think it does a good job of creating empathy. Empathy. I, mean, I and, think from, yeah. like, that might be a big piece for a lot of people who genuinely just don't understand what that experience is like. Not that I understand it, but I, I have seen people go through it. And so I think that if nothing else, it it does help to have compassion and empathy for what that must be like, um, which mm -hmm. I think is always like maybe a first step into respecting someone is to really empathize and to try to understand where they're coming from. I think you're very right. And, and it goes back to our conversation about normalizing trans people and the community as a whole, you know, that, that, and Jackie said it, or somebody said it earlier, just treat people with respect, treat people right. like human beings and it helps. It's right. one of the things that helps because you're right. How do you how do you experience something that you're not experiencing? Right. You have to experience it through other people somehow, and you have to be open to it and seeing it. And and something like pose that that is engaging and entertaining, but it also teaches is is an important piece of of our culture right now. Right, and I would say that you don't have to understand it 
in mm -hmm. order to respect someone's choice. Thank you. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So on that note, we are almost at 11. Um, so I want to, again, thank Michael and Jackie for everything that you're doing, of course, for being on the show today. Um, and we're really excited to see, you know, how the program progresses um, and sort of what you learn, I think, like within the first, you know, six months to the year of the program. Mm -hmm. um, and again, if there's anything that we can do to help support it, um, if you are, I don't know if you have um, women who are looking for specific types of jobs, maybe, I mean, feel free to send us whatever, uh, because, you know, we do know a lot of people in the community and I'm happy to try mm -hmm. to connect, you know, um, you or anyone else really to uh, a job or to an employer who might be interested in participating. So certainly think of us as your partner. Oh my gosh, we do. And, and the same, you know, if you know anybody, if anybody listening knows anyone that's in the situation where they could benefit from this program, please tell yeah, them about absolutely. that. Absolutely. Absolutely. So thank you to everyone um, for being with us today. I want to thank Eileen Berman and Jay Bauer for supporting all of our education and advocacy programs for this year. Um, and to learn more about any of our work or any of our grantees, uh, go to jwfpalmbeach.org. And then uh, Michael or Jackie, do you want to give the Compass website? Yeah, it's compassglcc.com. Um, but you can just type in LGBTQ Community Center, Palm Beach County in Google, and we're the first ones that pop up. Excellent. All right. Well, I hope you both have a great rest of your day and uh, hopefully we'll be in touch soon. So Absolutely. stay well, Thank be healthy. <laughs> All Thank right. You, everyone. Bye. Yes. Bye.